Good evening and welcome to our second night of our 2024 vegetable short course. Um, if you would start by putting in the chat uh, what your most difficult pest to manage is and what your favorite or most common beneficial insect is. Um, and when you do that, if you'd also indicate if you have a high tunnel, you can just type HT and we figure out what that is um, and your general location. So maybe you're nearest town in South Dakota or if you're outside the state, uh, you can tell us where you're at. I'm Rhoda Burroughs. I'm SDSU Extension Horticulturist. I'm based out in Rapid City on the west end of the state, but I do cover the whole state and I work with fruit and vegetable growers and I also work with produce food safety. So uh, my name was mentioned a little bit on Monday night about the food safety and uh, with production questions, you're welcome to contact me uh, on how to keep your produce safe. And we do produce food safety training. Uh, tonight, oh, I should, before I get started, uh, give special thanks to the South Dakota Department of Ag and Natural Resources for the Specialty Crop Block Grant, which has helped support uh, this series of the short, short course for vegetable production. Uh, remember the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. When you have questions, uh, please type them into the Q&A, uh, reserve the chat for, for like I said, the uh, most difficult pest to manage or your favorite or, and favorite or most common beneficial insect. Uh, and if you have a high tunnel answer for that, if you don't uh, just answer what you see in your gardens or what you'd like to see perhaps. <laughs> um, Tonight, it's our pleasure to have Dr. Laura Ingwell with us uh, from Purdue University. She's a assistant professor of entomology there, specializing particularly in integrated pest management in horticultural crops, uh, and in particular protected environments such as high tunnels. Uh, She's been interested in evaluating the role of natural enemies and biopesticides. So I imagine she'll be sharing some of that information with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Ingwell, welcome. Thank you very much. Before we start, I have someone raised their hand. Does that no. mean something that I should pay attention to? No, we'll, okay. <laughs> we'll draw it to your attention if you need to. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I see a lot of you talking about cucumber beetles in the chat, which hopefully I will give you some tips on that one today, or at least um, I'm going to tell you how we manage them. Um, a lot about grasshoppers. I'm not going to talk about grasshoppers today, and I hope that doesn't make you turn off your computers and run away. Um, it's interesting. I guess I should have known that, like out in the plains, grasshoppers, you probably have a lot more of them than we do here in Indiana. So we don't see them very often, but I think that one of the strategies we use for cucumber beetles would also help with grasshoppers. Um, but okay, so thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen and get started in the slideshow, which I have prepared for y'all. Um, remember to type questions in the chat if you have them as we go. I've asked that Roto will help and sort of interrupt me as we're going along so we can address those questions um, as they come up and I'm still on the pertinent material. And preferably in the Q&A because that helps oh, us sorry. keep track of them and <laughs> so they don't get lost in the queue. Thanks. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm not used to the webinar thing. Q&A, yes. Um, okay, so like Rhoda mentioned, I have spent most of my career working in high tunnel systems, so I'm excited to share what has been, um, I think, almost six years at this point, but I finally feel like for some of these pest complexes, we have a good handle on how they perform, what happens in a high tunnel, and how we can best manage them. So with that, let's get started. 
All of this is going to be in the context of IPM. So just to set us off on the same foot, this is my favorite definition of what we mean when we talk about IPM, and in this case, integrated pest management. I'm going to be talking to you today about insects, but this approach is relevant to disease and weed management. And so all of the pests that you may encounter on your farm. And this is an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests and their damage through a combination of techniques. So the key points here is long-term prevention. So that doesn't mean in one, um, in one season, one outbreak, you're gonna have a reflexive response and then um, sort of forget about it. It's year to year, what are we noticing and paying attention to and how can we decrease the pests? And then the other part is a combination of te te um, techniques. So it's not a one size fits all, right? So it's gonna be using different things such as variety or cultivar selection, timing in terms of when we're putting the plants or um, it may be the biological organisms that we're using out on the crop, the actual physical location of where the crops are being planted, habitat manipulation, biological control, and always as a last resort, pesticide use. And so we like to try to simplify this as much as possible and put it into sort of four basic groups of tools that we have in our toolbox. And we can consider these cultural tools, cultural things we can do with the way that we're producing our plants, mechanical tools, so that's usually physical removal or exclusion, biological, so that's using a living organism, and chemical control. But in particular, we're focusing on high tunnels tonight. And why high tunnels? Besides the fact that they're really interesting and fun to work in, um, they are really increasing in their use on farms um, throughout the United States and really worldwide. But in the US in particular, we have some government assistance programs that has helped to um, pay for the structures and get them put up on a lot of different types of farms. So, but in terms of protected culture tools, so you think about any sort of structure that you can grow crops underneath, um, high tunnels are relatively low cost for startup compared to say building a full on greenhouse, right? So when we're talking about high tunnels, we're talking about a permanent or semi-permanent structure that is built directly over the soil and covered in some type of plastic. The goal is that that plastic is capturing solar radiation and heat and warming the environment underneath it. It also has other added benefits such as protecting from rainfall, which may damage the fruit or the crop in some situations. Um, and also, you know, with more and more monsoon type heavy rains, it pre prevents flooding in that environment. Um, and so they really have a lot of benefits. They really do vary in terms of the level of technology and sort of fanciness that comes around them. Um, but what we really mean here is this sort of growing in the soil beneath a structure that is covered in plastic to help increase heat and radiation. Um, some of the benefits you can see here um, in July, I have a picture of melons on the left here um, and, and cucumbers behind them. So we can get this vertical growth and really high quality fruits because they're not lying on the ground. They're protected from, again, those environmental elements that sometimes um, promote diseases on the fruits or damage the fruit and the fruit appearance. Then we get into the season extension, which is really the benefit, especially in temperate re regions. So the picture in the middle here is one of our growers, um, high tunnels in Southern Indiana in December. You can see they still have a very um, lucrative crop of a variety of different mixed greens that they're able to bring to winter markets so they can continue to provide food um, and sell produce throughout the season. And then moving even later into the end of January, you can see this kale that's still not necessarily growing, but it almost being stored within these high tunnels, offering them the ability to continue to harvest this crop um, when outside the temperatures are 
not as cold as South Dakota, but um, um, quite cold. You wouldn't be able to produce these crops outside. But what you get with the sort of permeability of high tunnels is this really unique growing environment. So there are some aspects that resemble what you would experience in a greenhouse. And it definitely depends on the time of year. And then there are other aspects where it's almost more like an open field situation. So I tried to capture all of that in these pictures. Um, on the top right, you have more of like what some may call a caterpillar tunnel where the sides don't actually move up and down. You have to cinch the whole plastic up, but it offers some of that radiant protection and then low tunnels underneath it again to offer some added. So a very closed off environment, low light, low air movement. Um, in the middle picture down here, you have sort of early spring crop. They have one of the side walls opened. So some airflow and some movement um, in and out of the tunnel structure, but at nighttime, likely these are getting sealed back up because nighttime temperatures are getting too cold. So then um, in that situation, um, more like a greenhouse when it's closed. And then sometimes in summer, you have the opposite where it's difficult to even manage the heat that's happening. So this high tunnel over on the left, you can see has very mature crops all the way to the ceiling, but they have installed a shade cloth over the top to try to reduce that heat. Um, and what you can't see in the picture is that the sidewalls are completely open. So the situation for the crops and the subsequent insects that may colonize those crops really varies depending on the time of year and the way that the grower is individually managing the structure. Um, but the benefits of growing in the high tunnels really is around that temperature regulation and protection. So that's both in the air and um, in the, the soils. So what we have on the left here is air temperature outside of a high tunnel that's the dashed line that's happening here from October to January. And the subsequent inside of the high tunnel at the same location. So you can see it's just a few degrees more, um, but enough to help uh, buffer those really cold, low nighttime temperatures in winter and protect the crop that's growing within them. So keeping it above that freezing point. And then if you look on the right over here, um, the second graph is the soil temperature. And so outside, um, we're seeing temperatures around 2.6, this is Celsius, and under high tunnels all the way up to 5.57. And so it's a, a much more um, hospitable place to be producing food as a winter in these temperate climates. So then I, I want to introduce you a little bit. So a lot of the work that I'm talking about has been conducted at the research farm that we have here at Purdue and in um, collaboration with growers throughout the state. But we're really lucky. And the reason why I've been focusing on this type of growing environment is because we have quite a few of them available for us um, at our research farm. So this is an aerial shot of what our um, a part of our horticulture research farm looks like. Um, in Lafayette, Indiana. So we have six down in the front here of the Quonset style farm tech high tunnels. And those were erected in 2014. So we've been growing in them for about 10 years. And then we have an additional six of the Gothic style high tunnels that um, came from Nifty Hoops about five years ago. And then we have one little oddball over here that we got some state funding for where you can't actually grow in the soil. This one was um, constructed to look at research around soil temperatures in bedding plants. So it has a false floor where we can manipulate the temperature in different sections to look at um, early season production of like petunias and other flowers people would use. So we don't use that one for our entomology research. But so we have 12 tunnels, which allows us to manipulate the insect communities and release beneficial insects at the whole tunnel level and see what happens to the, the community inside. And so after all of these years, what have we learned about high tunnels? Well, we're getting pretty confident to be able to say there are definitely some pests that thrive in this situation. 
Thrips, aphids, mites, white flies are pretty predictable and things we might expect. They're things associated with the greenhouse. But these are the ones that are more surprising that keep coming up in conversation. Things like cutworms, slugs, leaf miners, cucumber beetles, and pill bugs. The things like cutworms, slugs, and pill bugs have a lot to do with the way that we manage the soils, the amount of high organic matter and compost that's been being put into a lot of these systems, and that suitable environment, moisture, um, that they really are building up large populations on farm where growers are growing 12 months out of the year and they're not giving the tunnel a rest. And so we see things like this um, with the pill bugs, which aren't really reported to be eating the growing portion, the living part of plants, usually they're dead decaying material, but we see such high population levels that they're feeding on the vegetables directly and causing some economic damage. And so the reason that they um, these pests do so well is because that while the tunnel's protecting the crop, it's also protecting the pests. And so when we talk about these soft-bodied pests in particular, we'll get into some of those characteristics. So things like aphids, which you see on the left, white flies, um, thrips transmitted viruses here on the tomato, and mites are really the biggest players and ones that we sort of predicted would do well in this environment. And that's again, because if you look at field conditions, the natural mortality factors or the things that really reduce and control those populations outside include things like wind and rain, which physically dislodge them from the plant. And then they're small and soft bodied. They can't crawl back up or they get eaten by predators that are on the soil surface. Diseases such as pathogens that infect the insects themselves or natural enemies and the food quality. Um, as food quality declines, if a plant is stressed, this is very generally speaking, but if they're water stressed or nutrient stressed, the insects don't do very well. They either um, they can't feed off the plant if there's not enough turgor pressure, or they'll just go looking for a plant that is more nutritious. When you're in the high tunnel and you're removing those environmental factors, and then you're providing this luscious plant that is almost always irrigated in some form and fertilized, so you have great plant turgor, great plant health, lots of excess nutrition, the insects take advantage of that and they can reproduce quickly and sometimes build higher populations. And so they are not at the ebb and flow of the environment and the stress that that puts on the plant when we have them under these controlled conditions. But then in doing comparative work where we had open field plots right next to high tunnels, we found that there were some other pests that we didn't expect that showed up um, and caused a lot of problem in our high tunnels. So here we're looking at two different pest complexes. This first one on the left is broccoli and the cru um, crucifer caterpillar moth complex that attacks that crop. And on the right, we have tomato or tobacco hornworm on tomato production. And the green or the gray bars here, excuse me, are the counts of those insects per plant in the high tunnel plots compared to the open bars, which are open field conditions. And what we're seeing is higher, statistically higher populations in these high tunnels. And when we really thought about it, we thought, okay, this makes sense because the way that these insects navigate, the moths are active and flying at night. They use visual cues and olfactory smelling cues to try to find a suitable host. Then they narrow in and they go down and they land on that host and they land on that crop canopy and they will lay an egg or a small cluster of eggs. Then they use the moonlight to navigate upwards and move to the next suitable habitat patch. Well, in a high tunnel, you get the moonlight filtered through the plastic, but when you go up, you hit the plastic and come right back down. So what you're getting is this aggregation of oviposition or egg laying on that crop because they can't navigate out of the plastic environment. Um, so I think that's what's causing this um, much higher populations for these lepidopteran or these moth pests. But really hands down the biggest challenges are those soft bodied insects. So aphids, um, green peach aphid, 
potato or tomato aphid. Thrips, these are one that take a little bit of practice with your eye to recognize. Here are the adults on a tomato leaf, but zoomed in under the microscope. This is a thrips and then mites. And here, what we're showing you under the microscope is an adult two-spotted spider mite along with the eggs um, that that insect lays. Um, aphids are a problem because they can sometimes transmit diseases, but most often it's more of the physical contamination on the crop that you're harvesting, right? As they molt from one age life stage to the next, they leave behind their shed skin or their skeleton, which we call exuvia. That leads to this white flaky insect parts all over the plant. Um, you can see the exuvia much more easily than you can actually see the aphids in this photo. Um, so that's a good way to train yourself on how to detect them. Um, but it's a contaminant on the product. And if you get enough aphids and they're excreting honeydew or essentially peeing on the plant, you'll get sooty mold growing on that. So that needs to be physically washed off if you want to sell that lettuce head. And it takes multiple washings usually. Thrips here um, feed on the foliage and for tomatoes and some other fruiting plants, they will feed on the fruit as well. Um, they create these windows on the plant because their mouth is scraping the plant. And so you'll get these little white windows with black dots, which is their frass or their poop on the plant. Um, they can reach high numbers and cause um, physical damage on the fruit, but the worst scenario is when they have tomato spotted wilt virus associated with their population, and then they can transmit that virus um, throughout the crop. And then mites we're showing on the right over here, um, they cause this stippling damage on the plant. So they're feeding on individual cells and sucking out all the green juices. So you get these little white dots all over the plant. Um, for the most part, they're feeding on the foliage um, but if there's enough of them, they can reduce plant growth. Um, and if the populations get really high with spider mites in particular, they'll cause webbing over the leaves and desiccate the leaves and dry out um, and can kill the plant. And then what we've noticed in most recent years is this new emerging pest. We call it emerging because it has been reported in Indiana, but very, very uh, sparsely. And oftentimes with um, contaminated tomato starts that are transported into the state. But we believe that um, they are, um, we have resident populations that are now overwintering in these high tunnel systems. And so this is a very small, what we call a micro Lepidoptera. The adult here is only two to three millimeters long. They have this really unique um, behavior where different stages of the uh, caterpillar here um, sometimes are inside of the leaf and mine the leaves and create these blisters or bubbles. And once they reach a certain age, then they move outside of that mine and they roll the leaf around them and they continue to eat. And then they will pupate right in that rolled portion. Um, when you get really high numbers, they'll go down into the fruit and they'll feed on the fruits themselves. Um, so it's a very small, hard to manage or hard to identify, therefore hard to manage insect. Um, and this is what the first year that we got a report, this is a high tunnel full of tomatoes in Southern Indiana. And so this is the level of damage that they're causing by mining in those stems and causing a uh, vine collapse. And so right now we're really working to understand how widespread this problem is um, and how we can train our growers to detect them earlier and prevent the damage um, that they cause. And the reason why I say that I think they may be overwintering is because at this point, the only place we're finding them is high tunnels and high tunnel uh, tomato is the most popular crop grown in that environment. Um, according to the literature, their lower development threshold is around 51.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And it claims in the literature that if you get below 50 Fahrenheit, they will not survive. Um, but we're talking about potentially pupae being in the soil and being protected from some of those lower temperatures and maybe being able to overwinter. Um, so that is some ongoing work that we're monitoring. Oh, and so if we look back here, we're talking 11 and 10 degrees Celsius. So if we move forward here in a project we're working on right now, um, you can see on the top here, 
the air temperature, and on the bottom here, the soil temperature in high tunnels throughout the state along this rural to urban gradient. And we look at them along this gradient because we expect or hypothesize that the urban sites may have some of that urban heat island effect and potentially be warmer um, than the rural sites. We see outside temperatures are very much, or um, air temperatures are very much below the threshold for that insect to survive. But if you look down here at soil temperatures, there's a lot of variability and we're really skirting around that um, survival threshold, particularly in some of our urban sites. And this may explain why we have found that on every urban farm that grows high uh, tomatoes in their high tunnels in Indiana. So it's one that we are um, paying attention to. Okay, so let's review some of our IPM approaches. What are the tools that we have to help combat pests in this growing environment? And these tools expand to any growing environment. Um, we have prevention, monitoring, biological, and chemical control. Prevention really is the key. And this is true for any sort of plant growing situation, right? You wanna start with a clean environment and with a clean plant. So make sure you're inspecting transplants if you're using those, um, or make sure that you have disease-free seed when you're planting directly from seed in the environment. Be aware of hitchhikers. So be scouting those little plants. This strawberry plug here is covered into spotted spider mite. So if you put that into the tunnel, you know you're already starting out on a bad foot. So you wanna make sure those get treated or preferably you just get new clean plugs. And, and you wanna to try to minimize reservoirs and secondary hosts. So that revolves around weed management, crop rotation, um, managing of weeds outside of the tunnel as well as inside. You want to make sure that you're scouting early and often because a lot of these uh, pests are very small. So you wanna make sure that you are looking often and catching them when there are low populations. So what that means is you have to look really closely. Um, some of them prefer to feed on different spots of the plant. So when you're scouting, you should be looking at the top surface and the underside of leaves, old and new growth all on the same plant because depending on what you're looking for, they may have different preferences in terms of which of those locations they um, would feed on. And then we do have some great tools like sticky cards that can aid in monitoring and early detection. The key to know here is that sticky cards are not a control tactic. They're just a monitoring tool. Oftentimes they're passively monitoring. So things like aphids and mites that move on wind into and out of environments, especially in the high tunnel once you have the sides open and are venting, to strategically place sticky cards along the opening or the entry, point of entry where people are coming in and out, are gonna help you to detect when those pests are passively moving into the system um, so that you know what, what to pay attention to and when. You wanna make sure that you can distinguish signs and symptoms between insects, diseases, what may be nutrient um, deficiencies or pesticide drift. And so what I'm showing you here on the left, we have a picture of pesticide drift, or herb herbicide drift damage, excuse me, on this cucurbit plant. In the middle here, we have um, virus symptoms on a cucumber. And on the right, we have some flea beetle damage. So being able to familiarize yourself about what those different um, stressors may be. Um, and if you're not sure, make sure that you consult resources. I'm not sure if South Dakota has a plant and pest diagnostic lab. Um, if not, I'm sure in the neighboring states, we can help you get um, correct diagnoses so you know what the problem is so you can treat it properly. Um, you wanna be able to distinguish the good from the bad, right? Not all insects or weeds are bad in, in a growing situation. So what we have on the left here is the brown marmorated stink bug, which we would consider a pest and is bad. It feeds on the plant tissues and the fruit directly and causes economic damage. 
But what we have on the right is a sort of lookalike spined soldier bug, which is actually a predatory stink bug that's actually feeding on small caterpillars and caterpillar eggs within the high tunnel. So something that you would like to have around and promote in that environment. And then you wanna be scouting for good bugs as long as, as well as bad um, when you're in that environment, right? So familiarizing yourself with the parasitoids and the predators and the, the symptoms that they may cause um, when they are present and consuming pests. And some really great resources for that are these two um, publications. The Garden Insects of North America is just a really, really interesting book. Um, has lots of great pictures in it and um, Good Garden Bugs by Mary Gardner, who is an entomologist at Ohio State. So these are great resources to add to your library. Um, and then this is the last one and we'll take a quick check-in break. And there are some tools that we would recommend um, you have on hand. This is a really fun one. Um, and a fairly affordable. So this is a little like USB or Bluetooth microscope. And it is great for being able to see mites and thrips in the greenhouse. And you can have your cell phone and that microscope right out in the field with you um, and get a, a zoomed in view and early diagnosis of, the, of whatever the pest may be. So I just wanna pause here and see if anyone has a question. I see that Rhoda did put in the chat the um, link for the plant diagnostic clinic at South Dakota State. Yes, and we will look at insect as well as disease uh, problems there. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, do you recommend that everybody get both the blue and the yellow sticky cards? The, um, so I have a picture in there that is a double-sided, right? One side is blue and one side is yellow. Ah. For a long time, it was um, best practices to use blue sticky cards to attract thrips and yellow sticky cards for a lot of the other ones. I think that the current recommendation is yellow is good enough. Yellow will do the job you don't need to spend extra to get blue and yellow. And um, so, yeah, I wouldn't, good to you know. don't need both. <laughs> and I don't think we have any other questions. Okay, I'm gonna jump right into now. the, we're gonna go on to the fun research stuff of, here's what we've been working on and what what works in high tunnels and what doesn't. So these are things that we ha um, have tailored to high tunnels. So the first thing we started with was augmentation biological control. The idea of adding beneficial insects into the environment to help with pest suppression. It's very common and successful in greenhouses. There's a huge industry. So there's a lot of different species that are commercially available for you to purchase. A lot of them feed on pests as well as pollen and nectar. So floral resources that you can add to the tunnel. And there has even been some work to develop something called a HIPV lure, which stands for herbivore induced plant volatile lure. So we've been able to identify the smell that plants create when a chewing insect is feeding on the leaf and we've put it in a lure. And what that smell does, it's like a call for help for um, predatory insects to come and save, and save that plant. But one of the challenges, like I mentioned earlier, is what happens to these beneficial insects when your high tunnel isn't like a greenhouse, when you're venting it and opening it. Um, so are they gonna leave? Is it gonna be unsuitable? Or are they gonna recognize, hey, there's pests in here and we wanna stay? So we started out examining this by comparing three different um, sort of techniques to potentially enhance this. The first one was just a regular high tunnel and we were growing tomatoes and cucumbers in this tunnel. So how, how do uh, biological control organisms perform in a standard production setting in a high tunnel? Then we decided to close all of the gaps to make sure that nothing could get out. So we use this very fine mesh screen, 400 by 450 micrometers, thrips proof. 
thrips cannot get between the holes in that screen. And then in the last one, we left it open, but we incorporated some floral resources beyond our fruiting crops and that lure that smells like a plant that's being chewed on. And we evaluated four different commercially available natural enemies, the green lacewing, the convergent lady beetle, minute pirate bugs, and that spined soldier bug. And so after some sort of mark recapture, we throw out hundreds or thousands of them in a tunnel and we come back a few days later, are they still there? We have those three different treatments again. So green is the conventional open tunnels. Blue is hip V, so it has that lure and flowers. And orange are the ones where we screened it and we wouldn't let them out. So the first thing we expected was that we're going to find a lot of them in the orange tunnel because they have nowhere to go. That's not the case at all. Um, and what you can see here is that we had very, relatively low recapture rates, but not too low for um, this type of work. Um, but we definitely see a very strong signal from the minute pirate bug responding to those flowers and that volatile lure. So the combination of those two are retaining significantly more of this beneficial insect. And what we saw over here and sort of um, a little bit with the pirate bug is this decline in recapture in the screen tunnels. So what's happening there? Why are we recovering less when we put a screen on it compared to um, when they're open? We also looked at colonization within the tunnels, and this is important when it comes to the cultural way that you manage the crop. And so we vertically dissected those crops since they are trellised from the floor to the ceiling. And what we found was much higher colonization and oviposition, so egg laying of the next generation on the lower portions of the plant. So position three and four, the bottom half of the plant. If you are aggressively pruning your plants and harvesting fruit and cutting all of these leaves off and lowering them every week, you are removing all of the new individuals of this beneficial insect um, from that habitat. So you may not be finding much control because you're taking out the larvae or the young stages that does most of the eating. Then we went ahead and we, um, we realized that the screening really was detrimental when it came to ventilation and airflow, but we saw some benefits. So our, our next step was, well, how can we make the screening work better? And what is a good target for the screen? So we ended up looking at three different mesh sizes. So that's the size of the hole in the screen. And what we were targeting here was cucumber beetles, right? Most of you mentioned this in the chat, so I think you all know who what the, the damage is associated with them. But um, for us in Indiana, we have the striped cucumber beetle and the spotted cucumber beetle. Um, striped is really the biggest problem, largest population. They'll feed directly on the plants um, and the fruits, but they also transmit bacterial wilt. And um, this is a bacteria that lives in the saliva. There are a lot of other cucumber beetles that can transmit it. And when they chew on the plant, they create a wound and that bacteria enters the plant through the wound created by the, the feeding. Um, they then deposit frass where they're feeding or the saliva around their mouth, and that's what the bacteria is in. It then enters into the plant through that wound and gets in the water transport, clogs it up, and causes the plant to wilt. Depending on which cucurbit crop you're growing, some of them are not susceptible to the bacteria. Cucumber and cantaloupe are very susceptible. Pumpkin and watermelon don't get the disease. So in that situation, you can um, tolerate more beetles because you won't get the wilt associated with their feeding. But what we were really excited to learn was that if you get the mesh size just right, and that's what we were testing for, right? So we started out here on the left with that very small mesh size. We saw um, absolutely no cucumber beetles in those tunnels. But we also saw some negative effects on lace wings and on fruit um, of flower abortion. So we increased it. We went up to one by four millimeters and then one that was almost one millimeter squared. 
And what we saw here over time was fewer beetles um, in the intermediate screen tunnels compared to the large screen. Um, and uh, statistically the same number in the open, but no bacterial wilt. So we are keeping them below that economic threshold and we are eliminating the bacteria that they transmit. In the larger screen tunnel in the second year, we actually accumulated more beetles. They got inside and then they really liked it. Um, and so we saw that bacterial wilt. We've seen this idea of exclusion netting on high tunnels applied to other insects as well. So if you grow small fruits in your high tunnel, um, we um, similar work out of Michigan has shown with that mesh size that's pretty close to one by one millimeter, they saw delays and reduced infestation levels of spotted wing drosophila on um, the berries, so cane fruits that they were growing in those tunnels. They also saw no effect on fruit quality, so ne no negative impacts on fruit quality from that um, the netting over the openings. Um, and they did record an increase in temperature, but not one that was detrimental to fruit production. So uh, the conclusions there, again, was around um, a recommendation that exclusion netting can help with spotted wing drosophila management in small fruit production in high tunnels and around the same size that we found to be effective against cucumber beetles. Can I interject a quick question? Yeah. How's, how do you manage pollination if you've got netted tunnels? So it depends on the crop. Most of the cucumbers that we grow in high tunnels that are bred for tunnel production are parthenocarpic. So they actually, you don't want them to be pollinated and pollinators um, are detrimental in that situation. In other situations, um, you can open it for a period of time to allow pollinators to come in. Depending on the mesh size, we did still see surfid flies getting into those tunnels. And lastly, for fun, you can always purchase bumblebee hives. You can get small bumblebee hives to put inside of a tunnel, especially maybe in something like a berry crop where you, you need a lot of pollination and you have a high density of flowers, that could support um, a bumblebee hive. But there are some drawbacks. There's always drawbacks, right? So something that we weren't prepared for and didn't pay attention to. Um, the first year with the really small mesh was aphids. So, um, what you can see here in that intermediate mesh size, which was the best for cucumber beetle management, we were getting upwards of 11 to sometimes 16 aphids per leaf on the cucumbers growing within them. And so what we imagine here is that, you know, while we're keeping cucumber beetles out, we're also keeping out some of the key predators for aphid populations. So this is where um, maybe augmentation of a beneficial insect to manage aphids would be good or just watching the plants more closely and using some um, organic uh, pesticides if aphids become an issue. Um, I just wanna give a shout if you look on YouTube, if you're curious about how to install exclusion nets on a high tunnel, um, I have a video. I think growers have come up with much better ways, but it's at least a start for you to think about it if you, if you wanna look that up. The other thing that we looked at in that study, right, was that diversification. And I think maybe that's the question here in the chat, is that for all or just the laced wings? Um, I don't know if that was talking about the, the negative benefits maybe of the screening. Um, we really saw that the most with laced wings and we did some um, lab assays with simulating the temperatures and it's really about the temperatures get so high that eggs cannot hatch and larvae don't develop. So the lace wing and the lace wing adults can die. I so they're not as heat tolerant. Laura, I think that was back when you were talking about the position and removing those lower, oh. lower leaves. Yeah, that is in relation to lace wing eggs in particular. And then you will see again, when we get to mites, we see something similar with the place in which predatory mites prefer to forage on the plant. 
is again on the lower portion of the plant. Um, but so there are a lot of other benefits that go along with increasing diversification. And I think this is sort of common sense for a lot of us, right? Um, but in addition to, so when we included these lures, which you can see here, there's one little white envelope hanging here and one hanging out down here in the distance. Those are those lures and here are the flowers. We can't disentangle which one caused the effect because we put them all together. But just to remind you, when we did that, we saw this increase in um, retention or maybe even recruitment of the minute pirate bug, because this is one that is also native on the landscape. But what we also saw was a lot of other beneficial insects that were attracted to or more abundant in these tunnels. So what you see here is sort of some broad common groups. The light gray on the bottom are spiders. The dashed line are surfed flies. Then we get into parasitoids. Um, and lastly, berytids here, which is this um, stilt bug. And you see increases in all of these organisms when we have that floral resource and that lure. And this is just what some of them look like. So we get the native brown lace wings and green lace wings. This is what the larvae look like. They're feeding on some stink bug eggs here. This is that predatory um, stink bug. And then here are berytids, and berytids are, or stilt bugs are an interesting story because when we first saw them in the tunnels, we were very excited because they will feed on caterpillar eggs. But um, as my colleague at the University of Illinois works with us and continues to do this work, we can actually, she documented this year that populations got so high in her tunnels with cut flowers that they began to feed on the fruits of tomatoes and actually caused plant damage, economic damage on that crop. So berytids, maybe I should take out of my beneficial slide because if populations get too high, they spill over and will feed on the plant um, and the fruits themselves. And here again, that screening is excluding them. So they're not able to colonize in that environment, which could also explain um, those increases in aphid numbers. So our take home lessons at this point are that screening is an effective tool management tool, but you really do need to consider the crop and the pest complex and choose the material carefully because there are pros and cons to um, installing that. And regardless, if you use any type of exclusion, make sure you are diligent about aphid scouting, even low tunnels in the field. Um, aphids are one that once they get under a protected environment, they will just take off. Diversification is good. It adds structural habitat diversity, and that's where the spiders come in. If there is a perennial undisturbed habitat, you'll have more spiders nesting and foraging, and spiders are one of the only predatory um, not insects, but invertebrates that will feed on cucumber beetles and some of the larger beetle pests that we have in this. Um, and then you're also providing more resource diversity for predators and pollinators. So in general, it, they're good to have in the high tunnel. So I wanna stop here again um, before we go through a little case study of, uh, I think I have two particular pests that I've pulled out and sort of the top to bottom, how would you manage them in high tunnels? Does anyone have some questions? Thank you, Rhoda, for putting my website in the chat. Um, oh, you're welcome. There's links in there for our resources and that'll take you to the YouTube channel. You do have a question about uh, citrus trees in in a greenhouse type setting. I don't know if you have any experience with citrus trees or not. I don't have personal experience, but I just was in Florida and talking to a colleague. Um, and to manage citrus greening disease mm -hmm. now, they are building essentially um, screened cages over citrus orchards. Wow. It's particularly important at when the trees are young, so like the first three or five years, to keep that disease off, off of them and then they can manage it a little better. So they're putting acres and acres in screened enclosures to keep um, 
the insect vector off of them. I'm having a blank right now in terms of what vector is it? It's a leaf hopper of some sort. Yeah, I don't recall offhand. Northern high tilt has a negative effect on the natural number of good, bad in general, the natural areas. Okay, so I think that the question in here about um, wondering if anyone has looked at whether having a high tunnel has a negative effect on the natural number of good bad bugs in general in the natural areas. So I'm wondering if you're asking here about like would a high tunnel pull them off of out of or off of the habitat that is um, adjacent to it. I think we have anecdotal evidence that would show you that in general, they don't like high tunnels. And so I don't think that we would see evidence of that. Um, if you think about the example with the moths getting caught at night, um, that's one example, one sort of group of insects that navigates by nighttime. Um, we do see a lot of lightning bugs and soldier bugs that come into our high tunnels what we are trying to figure out right now and what my colleague Casey Athey is doing in Illinois is looking at that spatial distribution. So for now, we've been putting the flowers on the outside edge of the tunnel. So we're seeing that colonization at the edge. We haven't looked at how far into the tunnel they will go. If that's only happening on the edge or if we put the flower in the middle, maybe we can get more movement in and out of the tunnel. Um, but no one has any quantitative data on that yet. Um, what was the soil test? Okay, so Jared, you had a question about were any soil tests done and subsequent mineral nutrient balancing as part of IPM. So I have not incorporated that into my work. Um, the literature on that front is not really there yet. We haven't caught up to it. The one thing that we have been able to demonstrate over and over revolves specifically around nitrogen. And if you have excess nitrogen in the leaf tissues of the plant, you are going to benefit those piercing sucking insects like aphids. And so it's really important not to, to not over fertilize in that situation or that insect can hone in on that extra um, surplus of nitrogen and they can develop much more quickly and provide much larger offspring or number of offspring building populations sooner. A lot of the other um, interactions between like microbial associations and macro micronutrients and um, insect performance is we're not there yet, unfortunately. Um, Sarah, I if you are a vegetable grower, no, you should not be worried about cicadas. If you have small fruits or trees, which is where the cicadas will lay their eggs on. We had a giant emergence maybe two years ago. Some of our growers with orchards um, put some netting over to protect the young shoots because they will lay their eggs, their eggs in the young new growth of the young shoots and can damage them in that sense. Okay, I think I got them. Oh, Charles. Um, yes. Sorry, I'm going to put this up just for one second, and then we'll jump ahead. So, Charles, let me know when you got it with a thumbs up or something, and then we will move on to our case study where we're going to start out with aphids first. Um, aphids are a fun one because they never go away. So if you grow in winter, you have aphids in winter and aphids in summer and aphids in every space in between. Okay, we can blow through the, why are they so annoying? So they're really small and sneaky. Like I mentioned, they can ex, um, vector some plant pathogens. In most of our situations, we don't have a lot of aphid associated pathogens in high tunnels. It's the uh, thrips that, that transmit the pathogens in that system. 
they excrete that sugary waste or that honeydew that I was uh, mentioning earlier, which can attract other insects like ants in particular, which will then protect the aphids from predators or parasitoids um, because they feed off of that honeydew. But then more importantly, it promotes the growth of sooty mold or this black film over the leaf, which then inhibits photosynthesis or plant growth. There, um, in some situations, the type of aphid matters. Most of the time, it does not. Um, but just for a snapshot of diversity, the green peach aphid feeds on over 100 different plants, while the potato or tomato aphid, depending on what you prefer to call it, only feeds on about 30 different plants. But this large host range means that rotation to an unsuitable host is nearly impossible. Um, in the case where you need to get a correct identification, if you're trying to maybe identify a particular parasitoid, um, it comes down to some really fine structures on the face and the, the butt end, so um, asking for help is good. So aphids complete incomplete metamorphosis, meaning that the young look just like the adults. And in this situation, there are no eggs, so they give live birth to offspring, clonal offspring that look just like the mother. Um, and they're all female. So winged individuals are shown here. It's the same species as the unwinged. This is all the same species here. And you have different color morphs sometimes. They develop wings when they need to migrate far distances to find a new host. Once they find a suitable host and there aren't a lot of other aphids around, they stop making those wings and put all of their energy into reproduction of wingless individuals. They feed with sucking mouth parts, so they don't make any holes on the plant. So you have to look on the underside if you're not sure if they're there. They can kill seedlings or young transplants just by pulling out all of that um, photosynthate nutrients from the plant. But um, also, like I mentioned, they can be a, an actual physical contaminant on the crop. This is just, again, a picture of that sooty mold um, and the plant decline as a result because it can't... Um, photosynthesize. So we have some cultural controls around monitoring and early detection. We have some biological controls which relate to conserving or adding augmenting natural enemies. And then when it comes to chemical controls, we have a wide variety of organic or conventional products. So monitoring and early detection, because of that wide host range, if you have weeds in the environment, winter, winter annual weeds, spring weeds, that can serve as a reservoir or a host for this pest. On the left here, you'll see some henbit covered in the little black aphid. On the right here, you have a mix of some broad leaves and some grasses that have aphids and two spotted spider mites residing on them throughout the winter in these high tunnels, which are not being grown in. This is just what's cropping up around the margins of the tunnel or um, in between the beds. Um, uh, one of the uh, natural enemies that we um, would consider and recommend for management in the summertime for this insect are lacewings. This is one that is natural on the environment, so you can do things like adding those floral resources for conservation biological control, enhancing what's already there, or you can purchase them and add them to the tunnel. Um, diversifying the resources by adding more flowers is really going to promote the adults being present in the environment because they feed a little bit on pollen and nectar, but they aren't predatory. Their job is mostly to mate and lay eggs. And their eggs are laid on a stalk like this with a little white egg on the end. They put them on the stalk because as they hatch, they will eat each other if they're too close together. Um, it's the larval stage, the immature stage, that is the predator. So starting from this little neonate hatchling here all the way up to this larger sort of alligator form, they are going to be feeding on other insects on the plant crawling around and capturing them. Another one that um, is really voracious at feeding on aphids are lady beetles. So I have a few different species represented in this slide. 
um, lady beetles feed at both the larval and the adult stages. So adult ladybugs are feeding on eggs and other um, aphids, other insects, and then the larvae themselves are doing the same thing. So you're getting sort of more bang for your buck because they're feeding in more life stages or for a longer period in their life. Um, the eggs are laid on the surface of a plant, and oftentimes you can see these sort of golden clusters of eggs on the plant. So those are lady beetle eggs. The larvae go through various stages as they get larger um, and kind of look like this shape in general. And then they pupate oftentimes on the plant or on the physical structure of the high tunnel around the plant. And so just to familiarize yourself, this is what an early stage, so the larva is latching down and cementing itself to, to in this case, it's where we had our fertilizer water mix for the injectors. And then they'll create this sort of pupil case around them as they transition into an adult and then the adult beetle crawls out of there. Another one that is um, present on the landscape in large numbers is the minute pirate bug, Aureus insidiosus. Again, here the nymphs. So this is a hemipterin. It's in the same, um, oh my gosh order, no, family as other true bugs, it has a piercing sucking mouth. So it's not chewing, but it's stabbing into your prey. And the larvae look like the adults. So they don't go through a pupil stage. So this is a, a, a larva, or in this case, we call it a nymph, stabbing into and feeding an aphid. They're kind of orangish with red eyes. And as they get closer to the adulthood, these wing pads develop. And then this is the adult form. So this black and white here over its back is actually its wings. But so they both are um, predatory and they feed on pollen. So having flowers around helps promote their recruitment into the tunnel. You can also purchase them and add them. Um, there are times here in the fall where they will actually feed on humans. And there's some reports that they do take a blood meal before they go into like hibernation for over winter. And so sometimes late in the in the summer, early fall, you can, um, they're annoying because they land on your arm and kind of give you a little poke. Uh, surfid flies and hoverflies are, are, it depends on what you call them, they are flies, are one of my favorites. So the, some people call them sweat bees, but they're not bees, they're flies. Um, but they land on your arms, around your hat. Um, they're lapping up sweat or liquids or looking for a drink, but the larvae are these little slug-like creatures that are predators and feed on aphids and mites, and they are actually very abundant in high tunnels. We see them quite often, so they're one to recognize and uh, familiarize yourself with in that environment. And again, they can be enhanced by including flowers in the habitat. That's what one of the adults look like. So surfid flies have, they mimic bees, but they only have two wings, whereas bees have four wings. And their eye structure and antenna are very different, if you can get close enough. But like I mentioned, aphids are still a problem in winter, and this is one of the uh, benefits of a high tunnel is you want to grow in winter, right? So this is from the University of New Hampshire. I've never gotten a picture at Purdue with this much snow because it melts before you can get there. Um, but when we have snow like this and really cold temperatures outside, it's still a bright sunny day. And inside that tunnel, you can have a pretty vigorous crop. Oftentimes uh, spinach is a common winter green that's grown. And that spinach can be infested with aphids. And so there are um, constraints on some of these predators in terms of day length and temperature, some of them go into diapause and don't want to eat at that time of year. So we recently, this past winter, um, in 2022 20, to 23, we did some work looking at two different things here. We were combining releases of predatory insects with applications of biopesticides to see what is the best strategy to manage this pest. And so what you see, these graphs are kind of tricky to get used to, but they're essentially survival curves, survival probabilities. So if they're going to survive longer, the line is going to be straight out to the end of the days of observation. If they're actually dying from whatever your treatment is, then the line drops down. So the first one we're looking at here is just the survival of the aphids themselves. 
And each color here is a different product that we evaluated. So water is our control in this situation. So that's the black line here. Pyganic is an organic compound that has pyrethrum. Nemix has the active ingredient as a duractin. And then Silmatrix is a silica-based product that you can spray on the plant. And so if you're looking at just the pest alone, we would say that Pyganic is the most effective. That survival probability goes down much more quickly than the other two lines. So under that cold temperature, Pyganic is still effective at managing this pest. Then we looked at how well do these beneficial organisms survive when they're sprayed with those same compounds here. And so you see no difference in the survival of the lacewing larvae. Um, the minute pirate bug does fairly well, although you see some um, decline with Nemix and actually in our water control. And same thing here, Adalia just didn't do well in general and um, don't perform well in the cold environment. And so what we recommend, if you have aphids on your winter crop, if you can get in there early with low populations, we recommend augmenting um, lacewing larvae as a management strategy. They were the one predator that actively fed and foraged in that environment um, under the conditions that we were experiencing in winter. And if your population is a bit too large and you can't get it under control with just a biological, you can also spray pyganic as um, a foliar spray to help knock back that population and then subsequently release lacewing larvae and they will not be damaged or hurt um, by that combination of treatments. And the other one that we've been spending a lot of time on, um, which we don't have the seasonality here because this is a summer fruiting crop, but cucumbers in particular and two-spotted spider mite. So two-spotted spider mite is um, one of the main pests on this crop, especially after you exclude cucumber beetles from the habitat with the intermediate size of the mesh screen. And so this is the adult here, uh, kind of translucent to yellow with two black spots. This is sort of the severe infestation levels that we get on cucumbers, where there are so many mites here, the leaf is completely covered in a web and you can see the little bodies all over crawling on that webbing. So the first thing we wanted to do was to, to develop some cultural control strategies. And we did this through var variety selection. So we evaluated um, multiple different varieties of cucumber plants that were bred for high tunnel production. And this varied in terms of the um, fruiting type. So were they slicing cucumbers or were they pickling cucumbers? And then we had some English and Asian varieties. And the way that we are evaluating the damage here is um, a score that we use to evaluate how much of the plant has spider mite damage on it. And so the higher the number, the more mites that are on that plant. And so what we're looking for here is which ones have lower numbers of mite showing that they are less susceptible to this pest. And so we would recommend that if you're gonna grow cucumbers, going for the Asian slicing varieties. So that's China Long, Itachi, Tasty Jade, and Taurus. They, are, they have significantly less spider mite damage on them compared to um, things like Corinto and Excelsior and Poignante, which are the English um, slicing cucumbers. We have a few pickling varieties that are mixed in here. So Adam Gherkin, Quirk, and Poignante. And unfortunately, we didn't see any differences in susceptibility among pickling cucumbers. So spider mites do well on all of those. Um, I hope my screen's not frozen here. Let me go on. So that's a hard one to communicate because in seed catalogs, you can select for resistance to diseases, but not to insects. So we're trying to get this out through some of our extension publications um, about how insects may vary. Then we wanted to look at predatory mites. There's a lot of different predatory mites that are available and marketed to feed on two-spotted spider mite, but we know that predatory mites and their 
ability to feed is very much impacted by the environment conditions, so temperature and relative humidity. So we did some assays in a growth chamber simulating those high stress temperatures in the middle of summer, and we were able to identify um, two generalist mite species, so Noceus californicus and Noceus cucumerus, that forage and feed under these high, high tunnel temperatures and feed just as well as the specialist Phytoceus persimilis. So this one is bred to and only feeds on two spotted spider mites. Um, and so what we were able to identify here and then validate out in the field is that Californicus and Cucumerus are ones that are more active and continue to feed in these hot and stressful conditions that cucumbers are facing in the middle of summer. And then we looked at where on the crop they're moving. Um, so like what we saw with um, what we saw with the lacewing larva. So here I'm showing you the change in the population of the nymphs. So less mite pest species on the bottom, more mite pest species at the top of the plant. So those predatory mites that we're putting out two or four days after release are spending their time foraging and feeding on the populations that are on the bottom part of that plant. And so that's something to consider when you're thinking about pruning and lowering these, um, maybe leaving in pruning, leaving one in every five plants so that you can harbor some of that um, beneficial insect at the bottom of the crop. And then the very last thing we did in terms of this in uh, this pest situation was evaluated some biorational pesticides to see which ones would be compatible in the situation where you have to spray a product and then you want to release a beneficial insect, which ones go together. And so these are all derived from a living organism or are a living organism. And what we found here was that in terms of controlling the pest insect itself, this first column, we see the greatest percentage of mortality, 50, 75, or 80% mortality of that pest insect with these four products, a neem oil, Grandivo, which is a soil-borne bacterium, Biocerus, which is a, a fungal um, pathogen, and Azagard, which is, I believe, a a neem product and a pyrethroid mixed together. But then we also wanted to see how these perform on the predatory mites that we're recommending. And what you see here is this ne negative impact or mortality facing the predatory mite when you use Azagard or Pyganic. And so if you are just looking at control of the pest mite without relying on um, any predatory mites, any of these four would be okay. If you have predatory mites present in the environment or you want to release them, then you should stick to one of the, these three and not include as a guard because that can harm that population as well. Let's take a pause here. I don't have a recommend. <laughs> Rhoda, I see that you flagged any any recommendations for mealybugs. Um, I'm assuming, Ashton, that you're growing inside because we don't get mealybugs outside ever. Um, horticultural oils and insecticidal soaps work well on mealybugs, but you have to physically cover the insect with that because the way that it works is it breaks down the cuticle and actual like the physical body of the insect. Um, depending on where you're growing, there are also some parasitoids that are commercially available, I believe, that you can buy for that. But if it's just like a house plant in your house, I would go for those horticultural oils or insecticidal soaps and just make sure that you're really thoroughly applying them on top of the insect. Okay, so uh, Shona, you asked about, can you use birds like chickens to forage in the high tunnel um, between plantings? Yes, but you have to keep the food safety aspects in mind. And so I have seen a lot of farmers do it. I think that maybe Rhoda said she works on food safety a little bit. 
you have to have enough downtime in there so you do not have fresh manure when you go back in. And I'm not sure what the rules are about that. The Food Safety Modernization Act didn't actually specify, it just says don't ever use raw manure or uncomposted manure, but they have said that they will not object to the organic rules, which states a length of 90 days if the harvestable portion does not contact the ground or 120 days if it does. And I would take those as, as bare minimums if it's during the middle of winter and and you're basically frozen, the bacteria that will compete with the bad bacteria won't be active. So I wouldn't start my my clock uh, during the during the middle of winter unless unless you've got <laughs> good insulation and or you're heating your tunnel. Thank you for help with that one, Rhoda. <laughs> Um, and then James, add flowers, what varieties would you suggest? So we have been playing with sweet alyssum. Sweet alyssum is a really good one. Um, sweet alyssum also harbors very large populations of thrips. So depending on what crop you're going inside of there. I don't know that sweet alyssum really works for ladybugs, but it works very well for surfid flies and that minute pirate bug. Um, Gomfrina is the purple sort of exploding little round pedestal one that I had in the in my slides. Gomfrina was a really great one that we saw a lot of um, insects colonizing. The other thing which may be surprising, dill. If you have dill and your dill goes to flower, dill is highly attractive to a lot of beneficial insects and in particular we've been looking at how well it works on urban farms but dill is the number one flowering plant that we have identified to colonize the most diversity of beneficial insects so those would be some suggestions i would start out with if you want to use sunflowers i learned this the hard way you have to be careful because a lot of new varieties of sunflowers are bred to not have pollen because it's messy when you cut them and put them inside the house. But if you're trying to promote those insects, making sure whatever you choose has pollen and or nectar is you're gonna get the most bang for your buck. Okay, um, I see that Rhoda put it in the chat, but I'm gonna just go through the last few here. So um, when it comes to spray information, the most comprehensive guide we have is the Midwest Bed Pr Production Guide. This may not be relevant if you're a master gardener or a homeowner, but there's a lot of valuable information in there and they are begin they're increasing the amount of cultural control methods. So it's free and it's in a database online. So I think it's worth investigating. When you are actually spraying in your high tunnels, all I can say is you really have to use caution. We are learning more and more that the plastic is slowing the degradation of chemicals. So if you're using conventional chemicals, you're gonna have higher residues, which can be um, safety issues for your workers and your consumers. In some states, every state varies in the way that you interpret the label for high tunnel use. Some states have very specific rules for high tunnels. Some say treat them as a greenhouse. Some say if you're applying with the sides open, you follow the field label directions. If you're applying with the sides down, you follow the greenhouse label uh, directions. So you really have to check with your state, but no matter what we recommend is when in doubt, follow the label for greenhouse application because that's going to be the most conservative in terms of re-entry intervals and pre-harvest intervals for um, worker and consumer safety. And la lastly here, we do see some um, benefits of other insects that are deterred by high tunnels, just by the structure itself. And so I want to make a short note on that. There are published studies um, with the grape berry moth not infesting grapes that are grown under high tunnel structures, um, less colonization of Japanese beetles, and potato leaf hoppers on those cane fruits grown under high tunnel structures. 
I will say this past year, we incorporated basil as a companion plant in our high tunnels, and it got disseminated by Japanese beetles. They found it and ate it all. So I don't know about when it came to raspberries in Michigan, they didn't find Japanese beetles in the tunnels, but they did in the field plots next door. Um, I don't know how far that will transfer. Um, most of this work currently is being funded by this Specialty Crops Research Initiative grant, where we are looking at the impacts of monoculture versus polyculture and that seasonality. Um, how does that differ in winter, spring, summer, uh, fall, in terms of what the pest complexes look like? along that urban to rural gradient. So we have two years in, two more to go, finding some really interesting things about how those um, practices and geographic variables influence the dynamics within the tunnel. We're also looking at, I mentioned some companion planting and what if weeds can serve as a companion and just unintentionally be placed in there. Can they be a reservoir or a host for some of the beneficial insects? And lastly, looking at entomopathogenic nematodes. So uh, this is a small organism that feeds on soil dwelling stages of insects and how can we promote them or can we utilize them in high tunnel systems where we have the ability to regulate soil moisture, potentially enhancing um, their colonization. And these are an organism, again, you can buy and add to the environment. So with that, I will just say thank you. Um, my postdoc is very good at Instagram updates. So if you are on Instagram, follow at High Tunnel IPM to see what's happening and pictures from all of the farmers that we work with. Or you can follow our project and resource production if you scan this on our website. So with that, uh, I don't know how much time we have left, but I can take a few more questions if there is any. We don't have any in right now, but I think we're all digesting the information. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. That's a lot. And if you want, I don't know if you've been providing, but I can provide a PDF of the slides if you want to share any of that. Or... We, we can do that. We have recorded this and it will be on the oh. website. I put the link in the chat a little bit earlier tonight. I um, want to remind people that uh, when you fill out those those darn evaluation forms, uh, it really helps us to uh, be able to get your feedback, learn what you're thinking, and it does help us when we try to get funding for for more <laughs> more sessions like this. So uh, yeah. we thank you for for filling those out. Um, yeah, somebody says it's like drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> I know, I tried. I tried to hold back, but <laughs> sorry. So, so you can go back to that recording and, and look through it. And uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and if you have comments or questions, we can, can forward them back to Dr. Ingwell. <laughs> yeah, any of you, feel free to email me directly. Um, I've never been to South Dakota State. I've been to a few towns there, but I'm always up for a road trip. <laughs> oh, we thank you. Oh, we've got a bunch of questions now. Uh... Yes. Yeah, so Ashton, um, I would not recommend rubbing alcohol first because it is very harsh and can cause plant damage. Um, and it's not registered as a pesticide, so you shouldn't put it on anything you're gonna eat. Um, but just like it is killing anything on the plant surface, it, I'm sure it's killing some of the microbes in the surface, uh, uh, in the soil. I don't know how much you would have to apply to do that. Um, it really is just best practice to use products that are labeled for pesticide issues. Um, and that's really about safety, safety for the consumer and safety for the user. Julie asked about cabbage moths. Oh, um, 
That screening that we use for cucumber beetles would also eliminate cabbage moths. A lot of small growers that we have, depending on the crop you're growing, if you can grow it under a low tunnel for just the physical exclusion of cabbage moths, that is very effective and um, also works to keep flea beetles out. Um, the other thing that works very well is organic formulations of Bt, so something like Dipel, which you can dilute in water and spray on. You have to do it repeatedly because cabbage moths, all four or five species that eat cabbage, um, you know, just keep coming throughout the season. But Bt really is effective at managing them. And I would challenge you to play around with varieties. I've been working at the student farm. Uh, on managing this pest complex in their, what they call their crucifer block. Um, so we have different varieties of kohlrabi, kale, um, cabbages, and you see huge differences in preferences for this insect. So there are some kale varieties that you almost never find the moths on and others that are very popular. Um, kohlrabi is almost free of it. They don't seem to feed on that at all. And cabbages, the tight-headed cabbages are clean and good. The Chinese leafy cabbages, which I prefer to eat, they go crazy over. Um, so there is some fun that you can have in your garden with just trying different cultivars and different varieties and see which ones are more or less attractive for that insect, those insects, I should say. Uh, where is the best place to purchase some of those chemical deterrents? I think a lot of people go to box stores, which does not have a very good offering. Spinosad formulations, and I think the common one you get at the box store is called like Captain Jack's Spinosad, is a good one um, that you can find there. But where I find some of the more niche ones is at like our local like family greenhouse garden store, or you can order them online. Um, yeah, at a few different suppliers online. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Dr. Ingwell. We appreciate you taking your time in the midst of a very busy schedule, it sounds like. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, appreciate the wealth of knowledge you've brought to us. It was my uh, pleasure. And you have an amazing audience. That was the most people I've talked to in a long time. So uh, congrats to all of you for organizing and having so many attendees. That's fantastic. We have most people in South Dakota and a number of out-of-staters too. So we awesome. we appreciate that breadth of audience. Yeah. And well, we, thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. We thank our attendees to be, for being with us tonight and remind you that our next session is next Monday night. You can use the same link. And again, if you can fill out the evaluation, that's wonderful. And again, this is recorded and has our last year's session. So if you want to go back, you can do that. And next week, uh, the Monday night session, we'll be having our graduate students come and talk about their various projects using uh, living mulches and tarping. So we've got that gotten cool. an array of grad students that are eager to talk with you and share what they've been doing. Everybody, awesome. thanks for coming. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.